not miss out on. In the meantime, let's bring you the latest details in terms of domestic developments and COVID-19 is the top news this news hour. In the latest COVID-19 um, figures, there were 656 new cases that were reported in the last 24 hours, bringing the total active caseload at the moment to 3,742 as per the Union Health Ministry's uh, Sunday report. Additionally, one new death occurred in the state of Kerala. The World Health Organization is urging Southeast Asian countries, including India, to step up surveillance and protective measures due to the emergence of the JN1 uh, variant. Uh, Dr. Poonam Khetrapal Singh, WHO's regional director, emphasizes the need for strengthened surveillance, sequencing and data sharing. Now, despite the low current risk of JN.1, precautions are crucial, especially during the holiday season. Vaccination remains crucial with approved vaccines protecting against severe outcomes, including JN.1. Dr. N.K. Arora from INSACOG has highlighted that no extra vaccine dose is currently needed for the protection against this new subvariant called JN.1. Now, the surge in cases has led to increased testing with Thane, Odisha and Maharashtra reporting instances of the JN.1 subvariant. Health experts have reassured that despite its higher transmissibility, the JN.1 variant is not causing severe infections or hospitalizations a good sign albeit authorities in mizoram have urged adherence to COVID norms during festive seasons and union minister shripad nayak has reassured citizens that the tourism industry stating that there's no need to panic citing the nation's successful past efforts in combating the virus maharashtra is preparing with ventilators and oxygen cylinders in light of 50 new cases nine caused by the jn.1 variant Kerala has reported 128 new cases and Mizoram has urged COVID-appropriate behavior during the festive season. Bihar, on the other hand, has directed increased RT-PCR testing at the airports. And on your screens is a little infographic on all you need to know about JN.1 variant. Uh, firstly, it was an Indian traveler who was detected with the sub-variant in Singapore. It was uh, then recorded in um, Kerala in India, but the first ever case of JN.1 was identified in Luxembourg and has since then spread to various other countries. Now, this sub-variant JN.1 is a descendant of the Pirola variant, scientific name BA.2.86, and the case was first detected in the United States in September uh, in 2023. Now, there is the COVID concern, but on the other hand, for the national capital uh, particularly, there is a pollution problem to deal with as well. And Delhi NCR continued to grapple with severe air pollution, marked by an air quality index exceeding the 400 category uh, level, as reported by the Central Pollution Control Board, the CPCB. Now, despite the enforcement of GRAB 3 regulations, and these are, these are visuals from today morning, uh, despite the enforcement of the Graded Response Action Plan Level Stage 3 regulations that were imposed last Friday, the air quality in Delhi remains hazardous. You can barely see the car and the blinkers uh, uh, over there in this, uh, on the pictures in your screens. Now, the overall AQI level in the national capital at 6 a.m today was measured to be above 400, indicating, indicating it to be in the critical category. The persistently poor air quality has led to health issues for residents, including a burning sensation in the eyes, respiratory discomfort and throat irritation. Urgent measures are required as the air pollution has triggered the third consecutive day of an AQI that has exceeded the 400 mark. The situation is prompting authorities to implement restrictions, including a ban on certain types of vehicles, essentially uh, the BS3 petrol vehicles and the BS4 diesel vehicles that are not allowed to enter or ply in the national capital. Um, construction activities, there is a complete and strict vigil on that to curb 
pollution levels. Now, following the latest measures, non-essential construction work is now prohibited in the Delhi National Capital Region, especially in the National Capital Territory, under the Graded Response Action Plan. And uh, the Commission has also restricted the use of BS3 petrol and BS4 diesel four-wheelers in Delhi and surrounding areas. Like I mentioned before, governments are instructed to enforce these restrictions, make sure that they are followed to the T. The Central Commission attributes the decline in the air quality to unfavorable met conditions uh, including fog and haze with low wind speed. And moving on, IMD has forecast heightened rainfall in Tamil Nadu and Puducherry with the potential for mist and haze in the early mornings. Now, the RMC is actively monitoring the northeast monsoon for withdrawal rainfall in Tamil Nadu and it may remain in isolated places, scattered rainfall until uh, well tomorrow. David Meanwhile, a high level meeting in the PMO assessed the post flood situation in Tamil Nadu, focusing on relief and rehabilitation efforts. Mind you, uh, the state and various parts of the state are still reeling with the aftermath of Cyclone Megjom. The Prime Minister's office and the PMO officials discussed the need for NDRF deployment and armed force forces assistance, including helicopters. The visit of an inter-ministerial central team to assess damage was also addressed. Now, uh, Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu, M.K. Stalin, he also took to the microblogging website X, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, meanwhile, Prime Minister Modi also contacted Tamil Nadu Chief Minister M.K. Stalin to discuss the flood situation in Tirunel Veli, Tutukuri, Tinkasi and Kanyakumari districts, the southern districts that were heavily, heavily hit because of the cyclone. He assured the state of Tamil Nadu of the union government's complete support. And moving on, the sports ministry, after suspending the Wrestling Federation of India, has urged the Indian Olympic Association to form an ad hoc committee for governance in the meantime. Now, the letter from the Under Secretary to the Government of India emphasized the need for corrective measures. Before the elections were held, the WFI was run by an ad hoc body formed by the Indian Olympic Association after former President Bridge Bhushan stepped aside. Meanwhile, the suspension followed the WFI's hasty announcement of organizing under-15 and under-20 nationals. In an official release, the Sports Ministry said that the announcement for the national competitions was hasty and that due process was not followed. The Ministry detailed that the announcement by Sanjay Singh was against the rules as a minimum of 15-day notice was needed for the wrestlers to prepare. On the other hand, the two prime wrestlers, Sakshi Malik and Bajrang Punia. Following Sanjay Singh's election as WFI President, Sakshi Malik resigned from wrestling. Uh, she stepped aside, hung her boots, retired from the sport in protest, whilst Bajrang Punia returned his Padma Shri award in solidarity. Uh, he kept it on the Kartavya Path, emblematic of his um, protest against uh, the latest elections in the Wrestling Federation of India. उसमें जो कारण दिया गया एक तो दिया गया है कि साठ टर्म में आपने अंडर 15 और अंडर 20 का 20 नेशनल का घोषणा किया है दूसरा रीजन दिया गया है कि ऑफिस आप उसी पुरानी जगह से चला रहे हैं तीसरा दिया गया कि नंदिनी नगर में आपने क्यों दिया और चौथा दिया गया कि ये डिसीजन उस डिसीजन में लोचब नहीं मौजूद थे ये चार डिसीजन दिया गया है मतलब चार नियम चार कारण दिया गया है उसका रीजन ये था कि 2525 यूनिट इलेक्शन में ड्यूटी वहां इकट्ठा हुई थी उसके बाद हम लोगों ने एक मीटिंग लिया वहीं पे इलेक्शन के बाद फिर वही मीटिंग को अर्जन करके इलेक्शन के बाद सारे लोगों की एक मीटिंग हुई जिसमें यह निर्णय लिया गया कि यह इसी कैलेंडर ईयर में करा दिया जाए जिससे कि बच्चों का साल ना बर्बाद होने पाए समय कम था उसके लिए सारे लोगों ने समर्थता जाहिर किया इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर नंदिनी गोंडा में था जहां कि दो नेशनल एक साथ कराया जा सके इसलिए वहां पे नेशनल सब की सहमति से अलॉट किया गया सारी स्टेट फेडरेशन की अनुमति सहमति दिया तब जाकर के वहां अलॉट किया गया फेडरेशन का नेक्स्ट मूव क्या होगा इस फैसले के खिलाफ क्या नेक्स्ट मूव है अभी हम लोग जाकर के सरकार से बात करेंगे मोदी जी से बात करेंगे खेल मंत्री से बात करेंगे क्योंकि बच्चों का भविष्य खराब हो रहा है नई फेडरेशन जो हुई है उसी दिन उनकी विदाई कर दी थी इक्कीस तारीख को ही 
और आज उन्होंने अपना पता भी दिया कि हमने कुश्ती से सन्यास ले लिया है साक्षी मलिक ने भी कुश्ती से सन्यास ले ले लिया है तो दोनों जो जिसके ऊपर आरोप लगा था जिसने आरोप लगाया था दोनों लोग सन्यास ले लिए तो अब दोनों लोग शांति से नई फेडरेशन को चलने दें बच्चों का भविष्य अच्छा होने दें जिससे कुश्ती जो रुकी हुई है कुश्ती की एक्टिविटी आगे बढ़े बार बार कुछ नेशनल होना होता है तब तक एक्टिविटी रोक दी जाती है रह गए उनके नहीं रिश्तेदार के बाद की बात जो उन्होंने कहा है वो क्षत्रिय समाज से आते हैं मैं भूमिहार समाज से आता हूं तो मैं उनका रिश्तेदार कहां से हो जाऊंगा करीबी करीबी का जो आरोप लग रहा है मैं भी उसी फेडरेशन में ज्वाइंट सेक्रेटरी था और वो प्रेसिडेंट थे तो एक प्रेसिडेंट और ज्वाइंट सेक्रेटरी के बीच में रिश्ता रहता है कि नहीं रहता है दोस्ती का रिश्ता होता है बातचीत का रिश्ता होता है ये तो रिश्ता था उनसे अब अच्छा हुआ कि बुरा हुआ अब जो जिन बच्चों जो बच्चे इस साल सर्टिफिकेट नहीं पाएंगे जाके उन जूनियर बच्चों का आप इंटरव्यू ले लीजिए उनसे पूछ लीजिए कि अच्छा हुआ है या बुरा हुआ है ये वो बताएंगे कि अच्छा हुआ है कि बुरा हुआ है चलती हुई कुश्ती को रोक देना निर्धारित कुश्ती को रोक देना कुश्ती में राजनीति ना आए ना खेल को खेल की तरह रखा जाए खेल मंत्रालय ने भी कुछ कन्फ्यूजन में डिसीजन ले लिया है बच्चों का भविष्य तो इस साल का तो खत्म हो गया अंडर 15 और अंडर 20 के बच्चों का तो इस साल का सर्टिफिकेट गया इस पर इस कैलेंडर ईयर का अब इसके लिए यही चीज जाके हम उनसे बात करें कि आगे कुश्ती सुचारू रूप से चल सके जिससे कि बच्चों का भविष्य अच्छा हो अगर मंत्रालय हमारी बात को नहीं सुनेगा तो लीगल ओपिनियन भी लिया जाएगा सेकंड सेकंड ऑप्शन लीगल ओपिनियन का है मीन वाल इन टेरर इंसिडेंट दैट वॉज रिपोर्टेड फ्रॉम जम्मू एंड कश्मीर a terrorist on sunday shot dead a retired senior superintendent of police mohammad shafi meer in baramulla city according to the police officials the shooting took place whilst uh, the retired ssp meer was offering morning prayer at a local mosque in the city's uh, gantamulla balai area the jnk police has cordoned off the entire area and has launched an investigation meanwhile the security forces are continuing their rescue operations in rajouri district um in an effort to hunt down these terrorists meanwhile a team of officials from the national investigation agency are at the site and have begun their search operations visuals on your screens from the 24th of december at that local mosque where the retired uh, superintendent of police was shot dead by terrorists in a gun attack the search operations has begun um it's been going on since the december 21st after a terror attack on two army trucks that claimed the lives of four army personnel and injured three others the indian army is also conducting an inquiry into the deaths of three civilians in the poonch rajouri sector Meanwhile external affairs minister Dr S Jay Shankar is scheduled to visit Russia from the 25th of December to the 29th of December as part of the ongoing high level exchanges between the two nations some archived footage between the two counterparts during the visit he will hold discussions with deputy prime minister and minister of industry and trade Denis Manturov to address economic engagement matters additionally dr s jay shankar will meet with his russian counterpart foreign minister sergey lavrov to discuss bilateral multilateral and international issues meanwhile what's really on the table what's uh, the agenda list looking like now the visit will also emphasize the strong people to people and cultural ties between india and russia with engagements planned in moscow and st petersburg it underscores the stability and resilience of the india russia partnership that is characterized by the special and privileged strategic partnership meanwhile various aspects of bilateral relations focusing on trade energy defense and connectivity are expected to be addressed as the annual india russia leaders summit is deferred this year slipping into a quick break lots more continues right on the other side don't go anywhere वर्ष 2070 तक भारत नेट जीरो का लक्ष्य हासिल करेगा दिस सर्टेनली वॉल ऑफ कैपिटल कमिंग इन टू द क्लीन टेक क्लाइमेट टेक स्पेस नॉट जस्ट इन इंडिया बट अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड
this and more streaming on world's first news ott news 9 plus download now and moving on french authorities disclosed that the majority of the 303 indian nationals on the flight that was bound for nicaragua suspected of being victims of human trafficking are anticipated to be granted permission to continue their journey and depart from france's vatri airport finally now french judges cancelled hearings for passengers on a romania bound aircraft due to procedural irregularities after 3 days in detention near paris the passengers resumed their journey some some sought asylum whilst uh, the plane's destination at this moment remains unclear legend airlines the aircraft company denied involvement in any kind of human trafficking or trafficking at all amid ongoing investigation indian embassy staff ensured the welfare of the nationals involved thanking french authorities for their efforts over the christmas holiday allegations hinted at the passengers intending illegal entry into us or canada via central america prompting suspicions of human trafficking Meanwhile moving on the Indian Navy is set to commission its newest stealth guided missile destroyer called Imphal at the naval dockyard in Mumbai on the December 26th 2023 Defence Minister Rajnath Singh will preside over the ceremony as the chief guest this marks the formal entry of the third Vishakhapatnam class destroyer crafted by the Indian Navy's warship design bureau and built by Mazagon Dock Limited Mumbai into it the navy's fleet and in the vibrant city of ayodhya in uttar pradesh preparations for the grand inauguration of the ram temple are in full swing take a look at this dedicated workers are meticulously cleaning the marbles and the stones ensuring the construction materials reflect the sanctity and the grandeur of the upcoming temple Simultaneously Ayodhya is hosting an awe-inspiring exhibition showcasing meticulously crafted idols of gods all of them made from clay. Now this event not only celebrates the rich tradition of artistic craftsmanship but also adds a spiritual dimension to atmosphere um, resonating with the impending inauguration of the Ram Temple of course. The city is being adorned with creativity as skilled artists paint mesmerizing depictions of gods on its walls. These intricate paintings serve as a visual um a visual tribute rather to the divine creating a captivating ambience that certainly echoes the cultural and religious significance of ayodhya just before the historic moment of the ram temple inauguration 22nd of january 2024 The following content may contain visuals that are disturbing, graphic or sensitive in nature. Viewer discretion is advised. This material is intended for mature audiences and may not be suitable for all viewers. Please exercise caution while watching and if you find such content distressing, we recommend discontinuing viewing. This disclaimer is provided to ensure awareness and to prioritize viewer well-being. It's been 80 days since Hamas's first attack on Israel. Since then, Nearly 25,000 Gazans have lost their lives in the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Let's get you the latest update from the war zone on your screens. At least 68 people were killed in central Gaza in an airstrike according to the Gaza Health Ministry, the latest airstrike and one of the deadliest ever. On the other hand, 166 people died in the last 24 hours according to the Gaza Health Ministry. Hearts in Bethlehem amid the ongoing war. this being said by pope francis a word from the vatican israeli forces meanwhile continue to intensify operations inside the gaza strip their operation to get full control over north gaza well that plan continues meanwhile 15 israeli soldiers have been killed in gaza since friday this being corroborated by the israeli defense forces around 20400 palestinians 
have been killed in the Gaza war so far. Bombings and fighting were reported in northern Gaza as Gaza health authorities and the Israeli military both announced mounting death tolls. Here's a report. Dense smoke rose over Gaza on Sunday. Israel says it has achieved almost complete operational control over the northern part of the densely populated enclave. But residents and Palestinian media have reported bombings in parts of Jabalia and continued fighting. And meanwhile, the death toll continues to rise. A Gaza Health Ministry spokesperson said on Sunday that 166 Palestinians had been killed in the past 24 hours alone. More than 20,000 Palestinians have died in the past 11 weeks of fighting. Tens of thousands have been wounded, with many bodies believed to be trapped under the rubble. Israel has long urged residents to leave northern parts of Gaza, but its forces have also been bombarding targets in the center and the south. Palestinian medics in Rafah, on Gaza's border with Egypt, said an Israeli airstrike on a house had killed two people. In the southern city of Khan Yunis, the Palestinian Red Crescent reported an attack on one of its main bases. The Israeli military has expressed regret for civilian deaths, but blames Hamas for operating in densely populated areas or using civilians as human shields, an allegation the group denies. Israel's military also said nine of its soldiers had been killed in the past day. That brings combat losses to 155 and marked one of the highest daily death tolls for Israeli forces in the ground assault so far. <laughs> Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the war was exacting, quote, a very heavy cost from us, but that, quote, we have no choice but to continue fighting. Speaking at his weekly cabinet meeting, Netanyahu also dismissed reports that the U.S. had convinced Israel not to expand its military campaign. The Wall Street Journal reported on Saturday that U.S. President Joe Biden had persuaded Netanyahu not to attack the militant Hezbollah group in neighboring Lebanon out of concerns it might launch an attack on Israel. Israel but Netanyahu said that Israel is, quote, a sovereign state and that its decisions in the war are not, quote, dictated by external pressures. Meanwhile, according to Gaza health officials, at least 68 people have been killed in an Israeli strike in central Gaza. The strike reportedly occurred in the Maghazi refugee camp east of Deir al-Bala. The 68 fatalities include at least 12 women and 7 children. Earlier, the Gaza Health Ministry provided a death toll of 70. The ongoing conflict has devastated parts of Gaza, resulting in the death of approximately 20,400 Palestinians and displacing almost all of the territory's 2.2 plus million people. The war exacts a very heavy price from us, but we have no choice but to continue fighting, says Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Meanwhile, during a weekly cabinet meeting, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed false publications claiming that the U.S. has prevented and is preventing Israel from conducting operational operations in the region. Netanyahu dismissed these claims, stating that Israel is a sovereign state and its decisions in the war are based on operational considerations no one else. Last night, I spoke again with President Biden. I appreciate the U.S.'s firm stand in the Security Council, a stand that supports our war effort. I told President Biden yesterday that we will fight until a complete victory, however long it takes. The United States understands that. I have seen false publications claiming that the U.S. prevented and is preventing us from operational operations in the region. This is not true. Israel is a sovereign state. Our decisions in the war are based on our operational considerations, and I will not elaborate on that. They are not dictated by external pressures. Well, moving on, in a southern Italian church, a nativity scene with two mothers alongside baby Jesus has stirred controversy. Priest Vitaliano della Sala's aim was to embrace diverse families in his parish sparking outrage among staunch Catholics and politicians. Now, nativity scenes that are common in, in Italy now entangle in cultural wars amid the nation's secular and multicultural shifts.
Slipping into a quick commercial break here. Lots more right on the other side. Currently, the industry is uh, facing a lot of challenges as far as demand is concerned. Basically, the US market has slowed down because of high inflation. So obviously, you know, uh, diamonds being uh, a dream product, something which doesn't have a utility value or is, is seen as a luxury. So that obviously goes off your shopping list. That's the first item that will go off your shopping list, especially in recessionary trends. The lab-grown diamonds are not mined and they do away with the entire mining. So they save up on all the environmental damage that is associated with mining and of course, you know, the mining cost, which is why they're even more affordable. It's people that is impacted by all these uh, recessions are the artisans, are the people who work in this industry, right? But uh, I think lab-grown diamond has uh, allowed them to actually use their skills in the same product. This and more, streaming on world's first news OTT, News 9 Plus. Download now. Verse 2070 tak Bharat net zero ka laks hasil karega. There is certainly a wall of capital coming into the clean tech, climate tech space not just in India, but across the world. This and more, streaming on world's first news OTT, News 9 Plus. Download now. The scale of the attack was something that we were surprised at. David Hadley was a double agent. The Americans did not want him to be fully exposed, so all that he probably shared with the Americans was not shared with, with us in terms of intelligence. If we had that, I'm sure that we would have been able to deal with the situation far better. This and more, streaming on world's first news OTT, News 9 Plus. Download now. जानना है तो देखिए समझना है तो सुनिए सीखना है तो पूछिए और कमाना है तो खरीदिए जानकारी सलाह और निवेश सब एक ही सुपर ऐप पर पैसे का सवाल है तो जवाब है मनी नाइन आजादी पैसे की अभी डाउनलोड करें वेलकम बैक यूर वॉचिंग न्यूज नाइन लाइव नाउ एज द रेड सी क्राइसिस वर्सेंस एक्सपोर्टर्स फेस चैलेंजेस इन इंश्योरिंग स्मूथ गुड्स ट्रांसपोर्टेशन Recent weeks have seen intensified Houthi terrorist attacks in Yemen, ostensibly in support of Hamas amid Israel's Gaza offensive. This has disrupted a key trade route connecting Europe and North America with Asia through the Suez Canal, posing a significant threat to global trade flows. As the crisis in the Red Sea deepens, exporters are wondering how to get their goods to market. Iran-backed Houthi militants in Yemen have stepped up attacks on vessels in the area in recent weeks. That's to show support for Hamas during Israel's military offensive in Gaza. The attacks have disrupted a key trade route linking Europe and North America with Asia via the Suez Canal. It accounts for about 10% of global GDP. Now major shippers including Maersk are sending their vessels around South Africa instead, a safer but much longer route. That has exporters scrambling for alternative air, land or ocean options. 
One German freight firm said customers were looking at so-called intermodal routes. For example, ship part of the way, then plane for the final leg. But air cargo capacity is limited, and it costs many times more than shipping by sea. Analysts at S&P Global say that leaves major retailers like Walmart and IKEA looking vulnerable to disruption. The crisis doesn't look set to ease any time soon. On Wednesday, the leader of Yemen's Houthis warned that they would attack any U.S. warships that attempted to intervene. We will not stand idly by if the Americans attempted to escalate further and commit foolishness by targeting our country or waging war against it. Any American targeting of our country will be targeted by us. And we will make American warships, interests, and navigation a target for our missiles, drones, and military operations. Washington has promised to establish an international naval task force to protect merchant vessels. But shipping firms say they are in the dark over when or how the force will operate. Meanwhile, they've started hiking fees for cargoes passing through the Red Sea area. United Nations trade expert Jan Hoffman says it all spells trouble for consumers, albeit not immediately. So if you have systematically higher shipping costs for manufactured goods, the consumer goods that you and I buy in the shop, it takes many months to really translate into higher prices. But it will come. The extent of the impact will depend on how long the disruption lasts. One US-based shipping firm told Reuters it was advising clients to prepare for at least 90 days of trouble. Meanwhile, growing threat prompts shipping companies to evade Red Sea routes completely. Hapag Lloyd, a major German container line, announces plans to reroute 25 ships by the year end due to escalating attacks by the Houthi terrorists. Hong Kong's OOCL is also making a similar move. More shipping companies are set to avoid the Red Sea following attacks on merchant vessels by Houthi militants. German container line Hapag Lloyd is among the latest to say it will steer clear. 25 of its ships will be rerouted before the end of the year. Hong Kong's OOCL is making a similar move. Ships will have to take longer routes to avoid the hotspot, and that could royal supply chains worldwide. The Suez Canal route accounts for about 12% of global trade. Costs will jump too, with the price of shipping a container from China to the Mediterranean up 44% just this month. Experts say anything that is moved by sea, from toys to food and clothing, could be at risk. Concern over disruption to supplies is driving commodity prices higher too. Metals prices rose Friday, as did benchmark oil prices. Crude jumped around 1%, though traders say the impact on supplies should actually be limited. Relatively little oil is shipped through the Red Sea. Much now depends on the International Naval Task Force being set up by Washington. The Pentagon says over 20 countries have signed up to take part, though some did not want to be named. Vessels from the US, British and French navies have already shot down Houthi drones in the area. On Thursday, UK Foreign Minister David Cameron met his Egyptian counterpart to discuss the crisis. It's absolutely essential that those maritime corridors, that the free movement of ships, of goods, of manufacturers, of oil, of world trade, that they keep going. The crisis grew out of the war between Israel and Palestinian militant group Hamas, which runs Gaza. Yemen's Houthis have threatened to target all ships heading to Israel in response. Meanwhile, shifting our focus here, unprecedented numbers of migrants continued crossing the U.S.-Mexico border into Texas over the Christmas holiday weekend. Starting on the 23rd of December, video footage depicted hundreds of migrants navigating the barbed wire on the U.S. side of the Rio Grande River, subsequently being detained by the U.S. National Guard. Among them were women and children, some dressed for the festive period as well. Meanwhile, Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador announced on Friday that his government would reinforce measures to contain migration. This statement followed a discussion with U.S. President Joe Biden, where both leaders agreed on the necessity 
for increased enforcement at their shared frontier due to the disruptive impact of the migrant influx on border trade. And moving on, initial results from the Democratic Republic of Congo's presidential election are emerging with accusations of rigging that have now come to the fore. Incumbent President Felix Shisekedi is leading based on votes from Congolese living overseas. Main challengers include Moise Katumbi, Martin Fayulu and Nobel Peace Prize winner Dr. Dennis Mukwege. Results from the 44 million voters within the country uh, they started releasing st on Saturday logistic challenges including late starting times and delays in delivering mach mach materials have affected all these counting stations. The Electoral Commission extended voting to accommodate all eligible voters. The election's aftermath has prompted 13 embassies including Germany and France to release a joint statement urging restraint. Foreign election observers from the Carter Center have called for increased transparency as the vote counting process continues. Moving on, a peaceful protest in the Serbian capital spiraled into clashes with the riot police. Thousands gathered in opposition to the ruling Serbian Progressive Party, expressing discontent following the party's landslide victory in the recent parliamentary elections. Eyewitnesses reported police using pepper spray as tensions escalated outside Belgrade's city hall, where protesters attempted to breach the premises uh, housing the local election commission. Some demonstrators scaled the building, shattering windows in a show of defiance. The SNS had secured 46.72% of the votes in the snap elections as confirmed by preliminary results from the State Election Commission. The situation remains tense as both protesters and authorities navigate this turbulent aftermath. And next up, European Union Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell has expressed deep concerns over the upcoming June elections for the European Parliament. Borrell fears that voters may be influenced by conflicts such as those in Russia, Ukraine and Israel and Gaza, leading them to support right-wing populist parties. Stressing the elections' is critical nature, Joseph Borrell urges an informed electorate expressing particular concern about the conflict's impact on the EU's future. He emphasized that the need for a swift change in Ukraine and doubts Russian President Vladimir Putin's willingness to halt actions. Borrell also highlighted the, the elections its significance, paralleling them with the U.S. presidential race. An easy right or wrong? Well, you can decide for yourself. Meanwhile, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has led to tragedy and immense suffering, altering lives indefinitely. The conflict has also reshaped Christmas in the country, with at least one Ukrainian couple believing the change has brought about positive outcomes. Russia's invasion of Ukraine brought tragedy and suffering, forever changing lives. It's also changed Christmas in the country, and at least one Ukrainian couple says the change is for the better. Lesya Shestakova was baking pastries for the festival earlier this week. She's a Catholic who has traditionally celebrated Christmas on December 25th. But her husband, Oleksandr, is an Orthodox Christian who has marked the festival on January 7th. This year, in an effort to distance the country from Russia and its Orthodox tradition, Ukraine passed a law making December 25th the official Christmas holiday. That means for the first time, Lesya and Oleksandr will share a single Christmas together. Lesya Shestakova told Reuters, quote, There is finally a day in Ukraine which my husband and I can spend together in the cathedral and thank God that we are together, alive and in good health. Our families will celebrate together too. On Sunday, they jointly attended the Catholic Cathedral of St. Alexander in Kiev. Since Moscow's February 2022 attack, 
Many Ukrainians have rejected the Russian language and culture, among other historical ties to Kiev's former ruler. Ukrainian authorities have also stepped up a campaign to rename streets and settlements, as well as remove statues and monuments tied to the Tsarist and Soviet past. Oleksandr told Reuters, quote, Russia, by its own actions, is destroying its heritage in Ukraine. Our young country is being reborn by going through this agony caused by Russia. And now, on December 25th, the country's rebirth will start with new holidays. Meanwhile, over the weekend, German police announced heightened security measures at Cologne Cathedral, indicating a potential New Year's Eve attack. The move follows recent government warnings about the increased threat of Islamist violence. Tracker dogs, they have been deployed to check the cathedral after the evening mass, leading to its closure. Now, reports suggested that security authorities in Austria, Germany and Spain received indications of potential Islamist group planning attacks during the Christmas and New Year festivities. And moving on in northwest China's Xinjiang, autonomous region. The synergy of cultural tourism and rural revitalization has transformed the entirety of the area. Beyond its renowned natural beauty, snow-capped mountains, glaciers, grasslands, forests and the alpine lakes, Xinjiang offers a unique blend of ancient city, its charm and a local folklore. Notably, Hemu village in Alte prefecture has drawn nearly 40,000 visitors since the onset of December, captivating both local residents and tourists with its spectacular scenes. A variety of ice and snow activities, including skiing, horse-drawn sleigh riding and sightseeing, have been uh, heating up the enthusiasm of the tourists as well. Well, it seems like that's the end of uh, our edition of Top Stories. We'll catch you in the other episode right on the other side. Lots more continues on News 9 Live. Don't go anywhere. City. I teach at Pace University and I was sitting in my office and I was working and I got a call from uh, my one of my nephews, Naftali, who had connections with uh, Princeton. And it seems that the Chabad, the emissaries, uh, had been searching around find, find, to try and find somebody who could speak Indian languages. So that's how it started. My office is in New York City, in Manhattan. So I just uh, took a subway to Brooklyn. So just around, the, I mean, uh, about 45 minutes or so away from my office. So I was there um, in the in the offices. Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to say more, but uh, I was there with uh, the people uh, and then I was uh, connected to Rabbi Levi Shemtov, who was in Washington. So I was there in New York, Rabbi Levi Shemtov was in Washington, and we were talking to people in, uh, in Mumbai. Well, he says, well, go ahead and uh, make progress, that's what you got to do. Uh, tell him that we... Uh contacted the through the ambassador here 
to, uh, to the government in New Delhi, and they need to have two more hours, they will arrange someone to call him. So tell him that as long as we do not hear reports on the news of any harm, we can continue the discussion. Lady Sahib, tell me that there is a lot of time time. He says that two hours is too much. It might very well have been, uh, you know, that uh, Chabad house was targeted because uh, it was close to their main uh, point of attack, which was CST. And uh, um, the Taj, of course, is uh, just about like 10 minutes away. So all that must have transpired uh, in some amount of time. And uh, um, it, th when they got to Nariman house, it sounds like, uh, you know, they went through very quickly. You know, I mean, you must remember that all the Chabad houses all over the world are very hospital places. They're open. You know, they're not secret. They didn't used to be secretive. They didn't used to be closed. Really, the purpose was to bring in, you know, any Jews who might be traveling around the world. It was like a home away from home for them. So it must have been fairly easy for these people to get in. And uh, it's not, I mean, of course, I don't know exactly what happened, but uh, it, uh, they probably, uh, uh, I'm guessing, killed a lot of people right at the beginning because we never had a chance to talk to the rabbi. Um, but uh, the people, the Chabad people, were, when they heard that there were all these things happening in Mumbai and also there had been, that there had been an attack on Narin House, so they were trying to get in touch with Rabbi Holzberg. Uh, but, uh, you know, he wasn't picking up the phone. Uh, ultimately, uh, again, you know, I don't know this firsthand, I heard about it. Somebody picked up the phone and was speaking Urdu. So, of course, they didn't know what language it was either, but uh, ultimately they figured out uh, what it was and they were trying to get hold of somebody who could translate. And of course, you know, it would be preferable if it were somebody who's Jewish. So, finding somebody who's uh, Indian that uh, you know they could communicate with uh, easily and uh, who could help that sort of a small set of people and uh, uh, I was uh, fortunately in a position where I could help <laughs> लेकिन हम देख रहा है अभी उसको थोड़ा बर्दाश्त कर रहा है अगर बात बात बनता है ली लेवी साहब को बोलो तो ठीक है वरना हम फिर सीना को भी भून देगा और इनको भी भून देगा आई डोंट नो एग्जैक्टली वेदर देयर वर एनी हॉस्टेजेस अलाइव एट दैट टाइम और नॉट बट वी वर एक्टिंग ऑन द अजम्पशन दैट देयर वर हॉस्टेजेस आई मीन आई डोंट रिमेंबर द एग्जैक्ट डिटेल्स बट एसेंशियली ट्रांसपायर्ड यू नो ही सेड हिज नेम वाज इमरान uh, now, whether he and he was speaking Urdu, so the concern of the Chabad people was obviously the lives of the people who were there. You know, there was uh, Rabbi Holzberg, uh, his wife Rivka, and uh, uh, their child. Uh, and uh, uh, as I mentioned before, there are always a lot of.